Good evening. I call the November 14th, 2022 City Council regular meeting to order. City Clerk Ben Lane, would you please conduct the roll call? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor David Ortega? Present. Vice Mayor Tom Durham? Present. Council members Tammy Caputi? Here. Betty Janik? Present. Kathy Littlefield? Here. Linda Milhaven? Here. And Solange Whitehead? Here. City Manager Jim Thompson? Here. City Attorney Sherry Scott? Here. City Treasurer Sonia Andrews? Here. City Auditor Sharon Walker? Here. And the clerk is present. Thank you, Mayor. Excellent. Um, we have Scottsdale Police Sergeant Sean Ryan and Detective Dustin Patrick, as well as Firefighter Rob Clark, should anyone need assistance. Uh, there are public restrooms uh, to my left, and other areas are restricted. Uh, let's begin with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, Vice Mayor Durham. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, um, we continue uh, to keep the people of Ukraine and the country of Ukraine in our thoughts and forefront uh, in, our, in our thoughts. So I'd ask that we pause in silence in support of their sacrifice for freedom. Thank you. It is my pleasure to present a proclamation. And <laughs> I am very pleased to uh, present a proclamation to uh, De uh, Gary Sprague and his sidekick. So what I will do is read it first, and then we'll come forward. I'll call your attention to the screen. Uh, you will see a very calm and common ambassador. Uh, that's the horse, I mean. Yeah, the horse. He's very steady, and uh, no matter how many kids and others want to say hi, uh, he's there just to uh, uh, enjoy and be hospitable for, for our downtown. Also, you'll see Gary as he is uh, strolling and, and performing amazingly. So let me uh, read, first of all, the proclamation, and then we'll, we'll ask you to come forward, Gary. <clears throat> From the city of Scottsdale, proclamation. Whereas Gary Sprague began his illustrious career as a singing cowboy over 29 years ago with his trusty horse, Steel, after being inspired by the Parada del Sol Parade, which lacked a singing cowboy. And whereas Gary became Scottsdale singing cowboy over 20 years ago, performing every winter season in Old Town, originally with Steel, and then with his trusty sidekick, Dusty. And whereas for the last 20 seasons, Gary has delighted Scottsdale residents and visitors alike with his performances, the show often stolen by the very talented Dusty. <laughs> and whereas the city of Scottsdale salutes Gary and Dusty as they ride into the sunset of retirement and thank them for helping Old Town Scottsdale keep its Western charm and howdy hospitality. Therefore, I, David D. Ortega, Mayor of Scottsdale, do proclaim today and rejoice, declare the singing cowboy Gary Sprague Day. Come on down, hey, Gary. Gary, you're amazing. Can you give us a few words? 
There are times in your life when you don't know where you're going to go. There was a recession in the 80s, and Peggy and I were living in Syracuse, New York, having only been married for six years. A year after I was laid off from my job, during my day job, I had been playing guitar and singing forever. Um, and we were looking for some place to go, so we decided Phoenix, Arizona area was the place to go. So we moved out here. Peggy had a job teaching deaf ed at the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf, and I was not sure what I was going to do. I fortunately uh, was asked to go up to Riata Pass and sing up there. So I was singing up there several nights a week. When Riata Pass closed, I went down and begged for a job at Greasewood Flat. And I literally had to beg for a job at Greasewood Flat, and I got it. And one night, a uh, Friday night, before the Parada del Sol, Ron Boring came up to me. He's a bartender. He comes up and comes up and goes, "You got to go see the Parada del Sol parade. It's so awesome. I mean, it's three and a half hours long. There's no cars. There's no trucks. Everything is horse drawn. It's really great. You got to go." And as the mayor said, I went back the next night and said, the "Parade was okay, but there's no singing cowboys." <laughs> and I literally, in the little building, if you remember Greasewood Flat, turned around and said, "Does anybody have a horse I could ride on in parades?" And so somebody loaned me a horse. And by the next fall, I was doing parades. And for three years, I did parades. And, and then I got a job singing at a dude ranch in Wickenburg for five years. And when that dude ranch closed, Peggy and I looked at each other again and said, what are you going to do? I said, I have no idea, but God will provide. Four weeks later, I get a call from Judy Pinch of the Old Town Merchants Association. We've heard about you. We'd like you to come down, and we would like you to audition. So I went down, and I auditioned, and we agreed that I would work for three years to see if this whole thing would work out. And apparently, we were pretty successful because it lasted 20 years. And, and um, at this point, what I want to let you all know is that the city of Scottsdale itself helped me create a career, helped me build a business. It helped me uh, make a ton of friends and enjoy so many different things, not only just Old Town Scottsdale, but working, doing educational programs for kids at the schools and doing performances in the libraries. So the city of Scottsdale has really helped me become the person that I am today. And I want everyone to know that. And I'm sorry that uh, we won't be in Old Town Scottsdale anymore. But sometimes you just look at yourself and you say, this is so wonderful. This is when I'm, it's time for me to walk away. So to all of the ambassadors who are here wanting to know when we're coming back, I'm sorry. And, but the, the fun thing is, when, this picture right here, the first year Steele and I were in Old Town Scottsdale, the city of Scottsdale had somebody take that picture. And in every wear magazine, in every hotel, it said, a horse walks into a bar. <laughs> Thank you all very much.
that was fun. <laughs> okay, one other item. Uh, in commemoration for Veterans Day, uh, Scottsdale um, launched a program um, spearheaded by our communications office uh, asking for uh, Scottsdale veterans uh, to be listed and uh, in the Scottsdale Salutes program. So as you drove up Drinkwater, you may have noticed banners celebrating the lives of uh, veterans, um, in some cases long gone and others that are with us today. I happen to have the two, uh, one from Winfield Scott, uh, he was not present, and one from Guy Stillman. So, of course, their family were uh, such great founders uh, of, our, of our city and philanthropists. So please make a note of that, enjoy that. The banners will be up until uh, November 21st, so another week, and then they will be presented, pulled down and presented to those families. That's one way that, I mean, we, it's just one way that we try to reach and uh, appreciate and know that Scottsdale appreciates our veterans. Um, at this point, I would ask for the manager. Do you have a report, sir? Um, yes, sir. Uh, so Mr. Mayor, members of council, we have a short video to share this evening. Looks like it's queuing up. Hi, I'm Public Affairs Specialist Stephanie Hirata with five fast things happening around the city you need to know. Starting us off at number five, get into the holiday spirit with a magical train ride. Holiday Lights at the McCormick Stillman Railroad Park runs from November 25th through December 31st. Experience a winter wonderland of dazzling lights and displays. Tickets are on sale $15 per person and free for children two years old and younger. Learn more and purchase tickets online at therailroadpark.com. Coming in at number four, mark your calendars for Saturday, November 26th as Scott's Dazzle kicks off its month-long holiday celebration with the return of the sing-along and tree lighting ceremony along the Scottsdale waterfront. This is just one of 45 events planned for Scott's Dazzle. Ten new events are in the lineup, including holiday hooves and howls, the dazzling magic shows, candle-making classes, jingle bar at the bridge, and the sugar plum tea party. Details for all the fun and festive events can be found on scottsdazzle.com. Next up at number three, City Council adopted new rules for short-term rentals. Ordinance 4655 requires owners operators to obtain a Scottsdale license for each rental property and comply with a number of safety, health, and neighborhood notification requirements. The ordinance takes effect November 24th and the license application portal will open November 28th. Owners must complete registration and obtain licenses by January 8, 2023. For more information, visit scottsdaleaz.gov and search short-term rentals. At number two, Scottsdale Salutes is a new program honoring local veterans. You'll see banners flying from streetlight poles in Old Town along Drinkwater Boulevard through November 21st, featuring 30 local veterans. This recognition program was initiated by the Scottsdale Veterans Advisory Commission, which are seven residents appointed by the City Council to advise on veterans' issues and to raise awareness of and honor veterans in the community. Wrapping things up at number one, Scottsdale hosted its annual Veterans Day commemoration at the McCormick Stillman Railroad Park on November 11th. This year's keynote speaker was Rose Maddy, a combat veteran and Black Hawk pilot. The United States Coast Guard Auxiliary Arizona Band kicked off the program with a half hour of patriotic music. Community historian and Air Force veteran Joan Fadala was also part of the program, along with the Scottsdale Police and Fire Honor Guard. Bugler and Army veteran Gil Gifford and members of Scottsdale Mayor's Youth Council. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank all of our veterans for their bravery and service. And that's Scottsdale's Fast Five for November. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Wow, terrific. <clears throat> I wish to point out for information uh, that during tonight's meeting, the council may make a motion to recess into executive session to obtain legal advice on any applicable item on the agenda. If authorized by the council, the executive session will be held immediately and would not be open to the public. The public meeting would then resume following the executive session. Uh, again, just for information, not necessarily likely, but it's a possibility. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, next, we will move on with uh, public comment. A public comment is um, an opportunity for Scottsdale citizens, business owners, and or property owners to comment on non-agendized items which are within the council's jurisdiction. Advocacy for or against a candidate or ballot measure during a council meeting is not allowed pursuant to state law. <clears throat> However, uh, it also must be within the uh, council's jurisdiction. Uh, no official council action can be taken on a public comment item. And um, however, each person stepping forward, please announce your name and address. And then you have three hours uh, with our timekeeper, uh, which you'll see as you uh, approach the, uh, the microphone. So we have uh, three requests, again, limited to three minutes uh, on public comment. Uh, we have Vespa Raineri, and then we have uh, Jean Ann Loporto. Please come step forward at the microphone. Hi, I'm Vespa Raineri with uh, Take It Easy Audits. I'm an independent journalist and a First Amendment auditor. And during one of my audits, I came in here to the city hall and noticed an unconstitutional signage, which prevents the public from entering publicly accessible areas, which is mostly the entire city hall. So I understand the world we live in today needs a lot of security, especially after 9-11, but to compromise the First Amendment, the US Constitution, for videography and photography from public citizens is not only unconstitutional, but it violates the First Amendment. There are areas that can be open to the public, such as the hallways and many offices to allow us transparency and accountability to bridge that gap from the public to know what their uh, tax taxes are going to, to speak to the ones who run our city. So I feel we have ample security. We have a lot of, I notice a lot of um, security monitors or uh, security cameras. We have a full-time policeman, a full-time security guard. So that should take care of the security. But to close off the entire building is a complete violation, not allowing us to, um, have that accountability and transparency. So let's, I say, let's get back to the supreme law of our land, which is the US Constitution, and not violate the American citizens' rights to watch the government employees at work. And I wanna end by saying this, the words of Benjamin Franklin, one of our forefathers, he said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. I know I'm probably at three minutes and one quick thing on the, public, on the um, policies because I noticed that in our world it's becoming policies are overriding the Constitution. Any federal, state, or city can write up their own policies, but policies were written for those employees working at those buildings to adhere for when they signed on to work there. Policies are not to be enforced by the policemen because they're to enforce the lawful land, uh, U.S. Constitution of our land and not impede upon our rights, our for, especially the First Amendment rights. So I say, please, let's get back to that. Remove that unconstitutional sign that says staff only be on this point. That takes the whole building away from the public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Jean Ann Loporto, who's also a Scottsdale ambassador. Then we have uh, Dan Ishak. She's a little taller than I am. Good evening, Mayor Ortega and council members. 
I am Jean Ann Laporto. I live at 7801 East Coronado Road in Scottsdale. I'm a downtown Scottsdale ambassador. Many of us have signed a petition to respectfully request the city council to reinstate the downtown trolley during the busy winter season, especially during Super Bowl week. The petition signatures represent 65 Scottsdale ambassadors, 110 downtown Scottsdale businesses, and 530 general public individuals for a petition support of over 700. 700 signatures. I know firsthand how important the trolley is. My car is located at Fifth Avenue in Stetson. In the past, there was a trolley stop right across the street. As a downtown ambassador, I would encourage people to ride the free trolley and experience our unique downtown. They could get on and off as they pleased and visit businesses in the historic Old Town, the Arts District, Fifth Avenue shops, and stroll the canal as they wished. There were many times people would return to my cart to thank me for giving them such a great idea. Actually, many visitors have been asking the ambassadors this year, where can they catch the trolley? Wouldn't it be better to have people fully experience our downtown area by a Scottsdale free trolley instead of driving their vehicles in the streets looking for parking spaces and causing unwanted traffic congestion. It is a win-win for all concerned. It helps the downtown ambassadors to direct visitors to an alternative way to travel in town, encourages people to see all of the downtown area, and also provides excellent exposure for many more businesses in our multiple downtown districts. Please accept these petitions, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, and thank you for the work that uh, you do every day and being the face of, of our downtown as ambassadors. Um, Mr. Ishak. Dan Isaac, 13530 East Onyx Court. Mayor and Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak again. I've got good news. My schedule is going to prevent me from attending any more meetings for the rest of the year. I've got even better news. I'm not here to complain about anything tonight. Uh, but rather, I actually want to express thanks and gratitude for all of the people that keep our city moving forward in the great city that it is. I've attended virtually every meeting over the past 15 months, and as well, I ran for a city council. That's afforded me the opportunity to really understand what it takes for our city to continue moving forward. So first, I'd like to thank the officers and their staff, direct and indirect. I've been more than impressed with their skills and abilities, as well as their dedication and commitment for, to our city. And for the council and the mayor and all the commissions and boards, Although I do not agree with every vote that's taken or any deci every decision that's made, nor do I agree with every single individual's view of what's good for the city, there is no doubt that you give a significant amount of your lives to make our city great. What people don't understand is that behind that three and four page agenda for a council meeting or a commission meeting, there are literally hundreds of pages of background that our council and our commission members have to review and be prepared before the meeting. That is on top of all of the emails, the calls, the meetings with staff, the meetings with residents, as well as all of the community outreach that they do. This part-time job, I'm sure, feels like anything but part-time many weeks out of the year. So I thank you for all of your service. I would also like to bring particular attention to Council Member Millhaven, who has given many, many years in service to the city, including three full terms on the city council. Again, not everybody will agree with her views or her votes, but it is undeniable that Councilmember Millhaven has listened to facts and data, tuned out emotional rhetoric and false narratives, and applied her, ide her ideology to bring our city forward. So I thank Councilmember Millhaven for all of her service, as well as her attempts to keep decorum in order in these meetings. She will be greatly missed, and she has big shoes to fill. So that's it. I just wanted to thank the staff, the council members, the commission members, and the mayor for everything they do for the city. And I hope that in this holiday season that you all have time to take off and spend it with the comfort of your friends and family. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, so I will now close.
public comment. Uh, there, as uh, according to our agenda. Next, we have the consideration of the minutes. Um, I would uh, like to hear a motion to approve the special meeting minutes of October 18th, 2022, regular meeting minutes of October 18th, 2022, special meeting minutes of October 25th, 2022, regular meeting and work study session minutes of October 25th, 2022. I'd like to motion, make a motion to approve, um, as the mayor said, shall I repeat it all? No, we're okay. okay. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Please record your vote. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Whitehead. Unanimous. <laughs> okay, next we will move on to consent agenda items. In this, uh, today we have um, 20 items, number one through 20. And um, consent agenda items have uh, been processed and uh, have all of the backup material available. Uh, they're considered as one motion. And we also have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, public comment on any of the items one through 20. Uh, in particular, I will mention that we have um, one public comment from Marilyn Atkinson regarding uh, item number 16 on the consent agenda item in support of 16 and a comment uh, uh, regarding entrance uh, posts and some improvements there. I don't see any other comments. We are open to any comment from council on any of the consent agenda items one through 20. I don't see any hands up. Do I have a motion for approval of consent agenda items one through 20? I make a motion to approve consent agenda, consent agenda items one through 20. Second. Thank you. We have motion and a second. Any other discussion? Please record your vote. Thank you. That is unanimous. Before we move on to the um, regular agenda, I do want to point out item number 19. Um, item number 19 deals with a uh, significant fundraiser and uh, community effort uh, called Scottsdale Stampede. Uh, the city of Scottsdale is subscribed and there are nearly 20 horses that are going to be uh, painted and on display uh, to showcase uh, art and our, uh, our old town. Uh, there'll be a whole walking loop all the way to Fashion Square crossing the bridge at the waterfront. So this was approved with our consent agenda uh, action uh, tonight. Thank you very much and we'll, we'll look forward to uh, everything as it rolls out in our community. M moving on to um, regular agenda items, I'm just going to clarify something as to our rules. Um, those in attendance um, per, our, per our rules uh, at city council meetings were asked to observe the same rules of order and decorum, decorum uh, applicable to members of the city council and city staff. So we asked um, the public to uh, refrain from unauthorized remarks or demonstrations from the audience, such as applause, stomping feet, whistles, boos, yells, and or other demonstrations shall not be permitted. Violation of these rules will result in the removal of our chamber uh, by our security staff. So I am um, um, asked to make that statement. Moving on, we have item number 21, regular agenda item, northeast corner of McDowell Road and Hayden Road, rezoning. Uh, the case is number 2ZN2022. We have the uh, presenter, uh, which is uh, Casey Steinke, is a planner. And then we will hear from the applicant as well as public comments. So uh, let's go to our staff planner. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Casey Sunke, planner with the City of Scottsdale, here to present case 2ZN 2022, the northeast corner of McDowell Road and Hayden Road. And you can see the site location here at that very intersection on the image before you. 
and a little closer up, specifically at the intersection of McDowell and Almeria Road. You can see the current site conditions essentially overflow parking for the existing office to the west. The existing zoning here is Planned Neighborhood Center, PNC. And the zoning will remain PNC, the only difference being uh, amending the list of allowed uses on this particular site. Uh, for the record, to the west is also PNC, to the east uh, is SR and C2, both commercial zoning districts, and beyond that to the northeast, R17, single family residential. The 2035 general plan designates this area as a mixed use neighborhood uh, into the northeast suburban neighborhoods. And we are in the southern Scottsdale character area. So with the recent history here, uh, the most recent zoning entitlements were done in 1984 with the office development to the west of the subject site uh, built in the subsequent year. At that time, some of the issues that were discussed at the public hearings were uh, buffering concerns. Now that was from the office, not the subject site here today and then traffic, both in general, concerns with new development, and then more specifically, concerns about the potential of people using Elmeria Road to bypass the intersection of McDowell and Hayden. Uh, that was ultimately resolved and, of course, approved by council. Uh, part of the stipulations they included were abandoning a portion of Elmeria Road to uh, discourage that, that bypassing of that intersection, and they also included uh, land use stipulations uh, striking out drive-through restaurant and drive-through financial institutions. And here you can see the, uh, the first stage site plan. Uh, pad A in the southeast is, is the site we're talking about today. To its west, again, is that two-story office development, which itself has a standalone restaurant to its north. And at the previous planning commission meeting, uh, some of the conversation revolved around a few items. Uh, both parking and land assemblage questions and then concerns uh, and questions about traffic and potential traffic issues and potential future tenants. Uh, the applicant has, I believe, done a diligent job trying to work with uh, some of the concerned residents to resolve some of those issues. Um, and he's here to speak if, if necessary on that. Ultimately, the Planning Commission did forward a recommendation of approval with a vote of six to one. And so the action requested before the council today is to adopt ordinance number 4568, approving a zoning district map amendment to amend the development plan and zoning stipulations of that previous case to amend the list of allowed uses and reintroduce drive through restaurant as one of them on that PNC site. And that concludes staff presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. And we also have the applicant here if necessary. Thank you. We'll move on to the applicant's uh, presentation representing uh, Upward Architects, Justin Gregonis. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Justin Gregonis. I'm with Upward Architects. My address is 5912 East Cambridge Avenue, Scottsdale, Arizona. Excuse me. I don't have a whole lot of, um, I don't have another presentation for you. I mean, Casey did a pretty good job of representing, you know, the project, but uh, I'll just point out a few things that, you know, have become some hot button issues uh, during the process. So, um, you know, we, we did work with neighbors. There were some current concerns with potential noise and lighting being um, portrayed into neighbors' yards on the other side of the commercial lots there to the east. And um, we do have a private agreement with um, one neighbor in particular to, um, to address their concerns um, in, in building a wall for them. Um, you know, one of the other things that this site does is currently there's two access points off of Thomas Road or off of McDowell Road that we will be closing one of those access points that would help probably with traffic, you know, issues um, because they're really close together. So. You know, we do feel like that'll alleviate some traffic problems. We are providing a pretty good landscape buffer on the east side of the property to help also with those noise and lighting concerns. There is a full screen wall being um, placed around the drive-through lane. The drive-through order pickup window will have a full covered pickup area. Um, look at my notes here. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, be happy to answer any questions um, that you guys have. 
Sure. Well, thank you. I see a, a question from Councilwoman Whitehead and Councilwoman Janik, but I do want to point out also that there's one public comment, which we will hear as well. So Councilwoman Whitehead and then Councilwoman Janik. Let's go ahead with, uh, please uh, come forward with public comment. It's an opportunity for uh, any uh, one to speak. Uh, three minutes. Uh, this is Susan Armanrofs. Good evening. My name is Susan Armanrofs. Um, I live to the east of this property. Uh, my home is to the east. Um, I'm at 1614 North 81st Street. My husband and I had concerns about this project, and I'm happy to say that we have worked through a resolution with the developer. It will be a nice uh, community amenity, and it will have attractive landscaping, um, which will be very nice for our community rather than having a black top lot. Um, I don't want to take a lot of everyone's time this evening, but I would like to express um, how nice it is to see the um, development process work really well when the city and the developer works very closely with the citizens of Scottsdale, like us, uh, to find win-win solutions and to move our city in a good direction. So I'd like to say thank you to everyone who jumped in to make this happen. Thank you very much. At this point, I will close public comment. And then um, I see a request from Councilwoman Whitehead and then Councilwoman Janet. Thank you, Mayor. Let me just get my screen back up. Um, I just love Scottsdale. Our residents are so engaged. So even though we're a city of 250,000 people, we get emails, the city council gets emails um, about every project, big and small, and provides us ways to make it better because we want to enable our businesses to thrive and invest and to help our economy, but we don't want to do it at the expense of our existing residents. So a huge thank you to the Armanovs for reaching out to me, a huge thank you to the applicant for caring. Um, and I would, I would like to make a motion, but I, I'm gonna add a few comments that I would like to be passed on to the DRB. Um, but with that, I motion to adopt ordinance number 4568, approving a zoning district map amendment to amend the development plan and zoning stipulations of case number 101-ZN184 to allow, sorry, to allow a drive-through restaurant on a uh, 0.36 acre site with planned neighborhood PNZ zoning. I would like to add that the City Council acknowledges a private agreement between the neighbors and the applicant to build a seven-foot wall, and I would like to ask that the DRB get my guidance that I would like to see stipulations for the landscaping that was shown on the site plan, and also to consider lighting to ensure that the lighting is uh, sufficient to keep the uh, project safe but not to annoy the neighbors. So that is my motion, thank you. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Councilman Janik and city attorney. Let me, let me just clarify from the city attorney, first of all, in terms of the base motion was the posted uh, 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 resolution. But uh, let me just turn to city attorney for a minute and then Councilman Janik. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council. I apologize, but I think there may have been a typo in that ordinance number. The ordinance number I'm showing is 4578. I just want to make sure we have that correct for the record. Yes, we have a different ordinance number, so let me restate that. So I motion to adopt ordinance number 4578, approving a zoning district map amendment to amend the development plan and zoning stipulations of case number 101-ZN-184 to allow a drive-through restaurant on a 0.36 acre site with planned neighborhood center PNC zoning with um, notes to the development review 
board that I, I would like to see um, the landscaping stipulated and lighting reviewed and to acknowledge that the council is aware of a private agreement between the applicant and the, uh, the neighbors. And the second agrees. Yes. Good. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we have Councilwoman Janik and then Councilwoman Littlefield. Okay, I have a quick question from the presenter. I noticed, I heard that you were going to be blocking off uh, some lanes, some roads, so that we would have traffic diversion. Um, could you just show those to me on, on the map? Um. Yeah, can someone pull up an aerial, or I guess I can, I can possibly, uh, that's a good one. So, just to the um, west of Almina uh, Drive is an existing driveway into the center. See, that's upside down. Just oh. Might be easier. Thank you, Mayor. There we go. There. Yep. So, okay. approximately right here, there is currently a drive cut into the center, which puts it really close to that drive cut. So, this drive cut will be getting closed off, um, and that'll actually become a pedestrian access into the site. And, um, you know, just uh, generally, traffic does not like um, drive entrances that close to each other just because people pulling in and out could cause accidents. So, Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. And I, it really is heartwarming when we have people in the community working together with the developers for a win-win solution and this should again be a model for the rest of us. Thank you. Great, Councilwoman Littlefield. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'll echo those comments, Councilwoman Janet. Uh, I was, came here uh, all upset about uh, some of these problems and these issues and the sound barrier and all that. It's all been taken care of. So I am very happy to reverse my expected vote and, and vote in favor of this. Thank you. Okay, back to city attorney. Mayor and Councilwoman Whitehead, my apologies. I stand corrected. It is 4568. You were right the first time. Well, you have two motions, so I think no, we're no, good no. to go. We don't need to amend the motion again. That correction is sufficient enough. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. 68 was a very good year, but, you know, okay. So, okay, we have no other comments. At this point, please uh, register your vote. Thank you, unanimous. Good luck with your project and much success. Um, next, we will um, move on to uh, regular, uh, to, the, to our agenda. We also posted a second opportunity for public comment. Uh, public comment is reserved for uh, uh, stakeholders to step forward and uh, discuss an item which would have to be within our jurisdiction. No official action could be taken on um, the comment. However, um, we have no other uh, public comment. So there's two opportunities for public comment, one at the beginning of the meeting, one at the end. Um, next we will move on to citizen petition. Uh, citizen petition is in our charter and it allows um, someone to uh, come forward with a petition, usually with the assistance of the clerk if there's uh, discussion, and um, we would um, we have received a citizen's petition as on our, uh, at our desk here and is duly registered with the uh, council. At this point, uh, we have uh, three choices. Uh, this pertains to the uh, trolley and, and uh, seeing if that can uh, continue to run through the, uh, uh, especially the busy season. Um, we have three choices. One was to direct the city manager to agendize the, uh, the matter, uh, petition for further discussion. The other is to direct the city manager to investigate the matter and prepare a written response. And the third choice was no action. Um, so um, we are in receipt of that. Do we have Councilwoman Whitehead? 
I wholeheartedly support the um, trolley, the return of the trolley, especially we're going to have a very big year, uh, 2023. Um, so I motion to direct the city manager to investigate the matter and prepare a written response to the council with a copy um, to the petitioners as a starting point. I second, second. that. Councilman Littlefield. Yay, we're there. Okay, so at this point, any other discussion regarding the petition? This allows us to take some action. Uh, seeing none, please record your vote. Unanimous, thank you very much uh, for bringing this forward. Um, moving on to the mayor and council item, um, which is item number 23. Uh, seeing none, then we would, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. We would um, move to the um, Mayor and Council item number 23, which is the boards and commissions, excuse me, and the task force nominations. I will now turn the meeting over to Vice Mayor Durham for the boards and commissions and the task force nominations. Thank you, Mayor. This evening, the City Council will be nominating Scottsdale residents interested in serving on the newly created Protect and Preserve Scottsdale Task Force. The task force will meet twice monthly beginning in 2023 and develop recommendations to Scottsdale City Council through identifying and quantifying unfunded needs for the protection, preservation, and perpetual maintenance of the city's open spaces, including Indian Bend Wash, Greenbelt, and McDowell Sonoran Preserve, public safety, and other needs. The Protect and Preserve Scottsdale Task Force shall consist of nine members representing different geographical areas, north, central, and south of the pit of the city. Appointments for these positions will be made will be made at a special city council meeting on Tuesday, December 6th, 2022. So let's get started with nominations for applicants in the northern part of the city. There are three available positions to serve as a member re representing the northern area of the city and 15 applicants. James Heidel has withdrawn his application from consideration. The applicants are Richard Bork, Rick Cooper, Douglas Drake, Mark Feldman, Paul Gary, Rebecca Grossman, Robert Halligan, Gregory Cruzel, Susan McGarry, Jace McKeegan, um, Mary Moore, uh, Pedro Romero, Cynthia Winstrom, and John Zikius, and of the original list, Alyssa McMahon has also withdrawn her application from consideration. I will start by nominating um, Richard Bork, Robert Halligan, and Cynthia Winstrom. Council Member Janet. I'd like to nominate Pedro Romero, Cynthia Wenstrom and John Zekius. Council Member Littlefield. Thank you. I'd uh, like to nominate Mary Moore, Pedro Romero, Cynthia Wenstrom. Mayor Ortega. No additional. Council Member Milhaven. I would add Mark Feldman and Greg Krusel. Councilmember Whitehead. Oh, I'm sorry, and Rebecca oh. Grossman, sorry. I've, my, I, I skipped a line. Sorry, thank you. Sorry, could you repeat yourself? Uh, certainly. Mark Feldman, okay. Rebecca Grossman, and Gregory Krusel. Thank you. Councilmember Whitehead. Uh, I'll just add Jace McKeegan. Councilmember Caputi. Rick Cooper, Rebecca Grossman, Gregory Krusel. So, of the candidates for the North, uh, uh, Richard Bork, 
Rick Cooper, Mark Feldman, Rebecca Grossman, Robert Halligan, Gregory Cruzel, Jace McKeegan, Mary Moore, Pedro Romero, Cynthia Winstrom, and John Zikius have been nominated. Next, we will consider nominations for applicants in the central geographical area. There are three available positions to serve as a member representing the central area of the city and eight applicants. Gerd Westman has withdrawn his application from consideration. The applicants are Frank Bertoni, James Enneman, Barney Gonzalez, Nicholas Hartman, Michael Norton, Cordell Overgaard, Daniel Swiker, and Mary Toma. Councilmember Caputi, can we start from your end of the dais? Sure. Uh, James Eneman, Mike Norton, Dan Schweiker. Councilmember Whitehead. I'll add um, Nicholas Hartman and Mary Toma. I have no additional. Um, I would have uh, Barney Gonzalez, uh, Nicholas Hartman, and Mary Toma. Councilmember Littlefield. Uh, James Ainman, Barney Gonzalez, Mary Toma. Councilmember Janet. No additional. Um, no additional. So James Enneman, Barney Gonzalez, Nicholas Hartman, Michael Norton, Daniel Schweiker, and Mary Toma have been nominated. We will next move on to nominations for applicants in the Southern Geographical Area of the City. There are three available positions to serve as a member representing the Southern Area of the City and 11 applicants. The applicants are Carla Carla, Colleen Forgus, Tanya Greenfield, Stephen Hertzfield, Henry Koenig, Larry Cush, Alex McLaren, Brandon Petman, Steve Terrell, Mark Winkleman, and Raul Zubia. Mr. Mayor, can we start with you? Sure. I I thought Mr. Winkleman. Well, Win, Mr. Winkleman still is in. I thought. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. So I would um, nominate Carla, and nominate uh, Steve Tyrell and Raul Zubia. Councilmember Littlefield. Uh, Carla, Colleen Forgas, and Steve Terrell. Councilmember Janet. No additional. I will nominate Carla, Brandon Putman, and Raul Zubia. Councilmember Caputi. I would just add Larry Cush and Mark Winkleman to that list. Councilmember Whitehead. No additional. Councilmember Millhaven. Alex McLaren. Thank you. Uh, Carla Carla, Colleen Forgus, Larry Cush, Alex McLaren, Brandon Putman, Steve Terrell, Mark Winkleman, and Raul Zubia have been nominated. This concludes our nomination process for this evening. Individuals will nominated will be contacted by city staff with additional information. I would like to take the opportunity to sincerely thank all who applied to serve on this special task force. We were fortunate to receive a great number of talented and qualified applicants. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. At this point, I will adjourn 
the regular portion of the city council <coughs> meeting, and um, we will now convene a work study, work study session. So, I call the November 14th, 2022 City Council work study session to order. For the record, all the members of council, myself, are present, as well as the charter officers. Work study session provide a less formal setting for a free exchange of information uh, as posted so that the mayor and council will discuss some specific topics uh, with one another and with staff. Uh, we can give uh, a nod or direction um, to, the, um, to staff and uh, fully discuss the general topics. It's an opportunity for the public also to weigh in on the uh, agendized item. As such, we allow for five, up to five speakers on our work study um, items. We have no public comment on the work study items. Therefore, I will now close the uh, public comment portion. And we will go, we have two um, areas to discuss. The first one is housing inventory and affordability analysis. Uh, we have our presenter, Mary Witkowski, Interim Community Assistance Manager, and Christian Caron, Senior Research Analyst of Matrix Design Group. Thank you for being here. Please proceed. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I come before you tonight to present to you the housing stock and inventory analysis. In September of 2021, during a work study session, you heard a presentation from the Internal Affordable Housing Work Group. And through your direction, we move forward with a study based on a set of questions posed by council. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christian Karen, who is with Design Matrix Group to present the study findings. Thank, thank you very much, Mary, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm gonna start by giving you an overview of what this presentation's going to look like. Um, I'm gonna start with an introduction where I basically um, provide you some information about our firm. Uh, then I'm gonna proceed to giving you all some background on the project itself. Uh, Next, I'm going to discuss the methodology that we used uh, to come to the findings, uh, which I will discuss after that. Um, and I will uh, finish up by going over some of the conclusions that we came to, as well as uh, some of the recommendations uh, that we think should be considered. Um, and finally, um, at the meeting, uh, last year where housing was discussed, um, there were a number of questions that the council had that we were asked to address, um, and I will be covering those um, at the end of the uh, slideshow. Okay, so just some quick uh, background on our firm. Uh, so we're an employee-owned firm uh, founded in 1999. Uh, we are primarily an engineering uh, planning and consulting firm. Uh, we have 12 offices uh, throughout the U.S., including one based here in Phoenix, so we do a lot of work for clients in the Phoenix area. Uh, the team that brought you this study was Matrix's Government Consulting uh, Services. We're a team of military engineers, uh, planners, and economic analysts. Uh, we uh, do a lot of consulting work for defense communities, uh, but we have also started to delve into the area of housing. Okay, so some background on the project itself. So we, oh, sorry. <laughs> so some background on the project itself. Uh, we were retained in December 2021 to conduct the analysis and the primary goal of the study uh, was to improve the city's understanding of the distribution and categorization 
of the occupied housing stock, so the homes that were not vacant, right, the ones people were actually uh, living in. Uh, and the emphasis was on uh, quantity and affordability. Um, and to provide further context to the findings uh, and to give you all a sense of how uh, you are faring, uh, we compared you uh, to six peer communities. Three were in um, California, and those were La Laguna Beach, Pasadena, and Walnut Creek. Um, one was in Colorado, Cherry Creek. Uh, we also compared you to Tempe, as well as Santa Fe, New Mexico. Okay, um, so I'm gonna breeze through this as quickly as I can, because um, this is getting a little bit too much into the weeds. Um, but uh, we utilized a variety of uh, data sources. The primary one uh, was the 2020 uh, version of the American Community Survey, which I'll refer to uh, from now on as the ACS. Um, now, uh, the benefit of the ACS is it provides a lot of rich and detailed data. Uh, but the latest estimates are from 2020, so only the first year of the COVID pandemic is reflected in the uh, data. We, as a supplementary data source, we use Redfin uh, data, uh, which uh, provides monthly data through essentially the present, but it's not quite as detailed as the data from the ACS. Um, and uh, we, what we essentially did um, was uh, at the core of the analysis was we used ACS uh, data on household income and on housing units in combination with HUD estimates of median family income for the Phoenix MSA. And uh, at the core of our study were what are known as gap analyses, uh, which estimate the difference between supply and demand um, at various income tiers as a percentage of median family income. Uh, so the purpose of these analyses was really to reveal the price points, right, where there exist surpluses and deficits of uh, housing. Um, so to conduct the analysis, we sorted uh, your households uh, and your housing units um, into the following income tiers. Um, and those were affordable, uh, workforce, market rate, and uh, luxury. Um, so to give you an idea of how this works, um, a market rate home is a home that would be considered affordable to a family with a median household income between 120% and 200% of the Phoenix MSA median family income. Okay. Uh, Slides. Okay, so um, here is a map of the Phoenix MSA uh, that was created by our, GS, by our GIS team at Matrix. Um, and this shouldn't be much of a surprise to you. Uh, and these data, by the way, are from 2020. Um, the median family income in Scottsdale was over $122,000, uh, whereas for the Phoenix MSA, uh, it was about $78,000. Okay, and here are the main findings. These are the big takeaways that I want you uh, to leave with. So, of the homes that are owned in the city of Scottsdale, 83% are market rate or luxury homes, uh, which... Uh, is a rate that puts you in the middle of the pack, right? Um, so that's a higher rate than Santa Fe and Tempe, uh, but a lower rate than the other 
uh, for uh, cities. Um, so what this essentially means is that 83% of your homes uh, that are owned in Scottsdale are not affordable for people earning less than 120% of median family income for the Phoenix MSA area. Um, now, uh, what this implies is that you have a severe shortage of affordable and workforce housing, right? These are the types of homes that are gonna be suitable uh, for low and middle income uh, families. Uh, now, I think the table on the following uh, slide will uh, make this clear. So the way to interpret this uh, slide um, is that the owner demand uh, column, uh, that displays the number of Scottsdale households uh, that are in a particular income tier. So in Scottsdale, you have um, around uh, 6,831 households that earn between uh, zero and 30% 0 and 30 of median family income for the Phoenix MSA, okay? And the way to interpret the unit supply column uh, is that this, represent, this represents the number of homes that are affordable to a family earning between uh, zero to 30 percent of median family income. And um, the last uh, column, uh, that displays the gap between demand and supply at each income tier. If the number is in parentheses and, and in red, that means you have a housing deficit. You do not have, a, you, you have an insufficient number of homes at that income range. Uh, by contrast, if the number is in uh, black, that means you have a housing surplus. Um, so in an ideal world, uh, owner demand and unit supply would be very close, right? Um, and there would be a small gap at each income uh, tier. Uh, but that's not quite uh, what you see here, okay? So in total, um, across the first four rows, so from the affordable to the workforce uh, ranges, you have uh, uh, 30, you, you have in, in total about 33,000 households. Uh, so you have 33,000 households that could only afford an affordable or uh, workforce uh, home. However, you only have 14,000 homes uh, that are in the affordable or workforce uh, ranges. So you have a housing deficit of about uh, 19,000 units when looking at the affordable and workforce uh, ranges. And um, the other side of the coin is you have a, a surplus of homes that are available at the market rate or at luxury price, okay? Uh, so there is uh, some good news though, okay? So, uh, Although many homeowners in Scottsdale are stretching their budgets to stay in their homes, uh, what the data indicate is that the median Scottsdale homeowner is able to keep uh, their monthly housing costs to less than 30% of their income, which is considered the gold standard, essentially. So, we, so th there are definitely some people who are stretching their, their budgets, but the median homeowner in Scottsdale is doing uh, well. However, um, and this is not surprising, uh, given uh, the gap in median family income between Scottsdale and the broader Phoenix area, uh, Scottsdale is significantly less affordable to families who live just outside the uh, city's borders. 
Um, and this is a trend that has been exacerbated by soaring housing costs. Um, all, although starting in uh, the middle of 2022, as I'll get to later on, uh, the housing market has started to uh, calm down a bit. Uh, now, here's some more good news. Uh, the rental stock is concentrated in the affordable and workforce ranges. So what this means is um, uh, a bulk, a, the uh, bulk of your rental homes, okay, are affordable uh, to people earning less than 120% of the median family income for the Phoenix area. Uh, and um, what's also good news is that uh, in the 50 to 80% of median family income range, and I'll show you a table in just a second that makes this more clear, you do have a lot of units. You have a large surplus of uh, homes. Okay, so this slide displays uh, the supply-demand gaps in the renter-occupied market. And uh, what you'll see here is that, uh, like I said previously, uh, you have a high percentage of homes. Um, I believe it's, the, it's uh, well over a majority of your rental homes. Uh, they are in the affordable and workforce uh, ranges, right? But what also is noteworthy is at the extreme ends of the income distribution for rental homes, right? For households earning between zero to 30% of median family income. Bless you, Mayor. Thank you. you do not have enough uh, rental units uh, for these um, families, which really underscores the importance of Section 8 uh, vouchers, right? Uh, also, uh, this, is, this was an interesting finding as well. When it comes to the most expensive uh, types of rental housing, uh, you also uh, seem to be falling a bit short. Okay, so here are some conclusions and recommendations. So, um, let's see. So, uh, as you probably know, uh, Scottsdale is older than the rest of the Phoenix MSA. Uh, the median age is around, I think from the last census, around 50 years old or so. Uh, whereas for the Phoenix MSA, it's in the mid 30s. Uh, and one thing that explains Scotch, Scottsdale's age demographics in our view um, is the upper class orientation of the ownership market. Lots of younger families just can't afford to buy a house in Scottsdale. Uh, for low to moderate income uh, households, uh, renting is often uh, going to be the only affordable um, option. Okay. Uh, Scottsdale uh, does have a low percentage of cost burdened renters, uh, meaning renters who are spending uh, less than 30% of their incomes uh, on uh, monthly rent. Um, and in particular, uh, the other cities that we studied uh, had higher rates of cost burden renters. Um, so this is a good sign and um, it is a direct result of the fact that a lot of your rental stock is concentrated in the affordable and workforce range. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize that uh, for the lowest income residents, uh, there does not seem to be enough housing. Uh, next, if Scottsdale wants to prioritize affordable and workforce housing, 
Uh, the city may have to explore reforms, including density bonuses, uh, which are a form of inclusionary zoning. Uh, this is a program that increases the number of units per acre that a developer can build uh, in exchange for guaranteeing that a certain percentage of those units will be affordable housing. Um, we think that the evidence shows, uh, given uh, the sharp deficit in rental housing at the lowest income range, that the proposed multifamily uh, projects require careful consideration. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about short-term rentals, and I'll talk about them more later on. Uh, but we did find that they occupy a portion of the housing market, and in turn, they reduce uh, supply and raise costs. Um, and, and finally, uh, we understand that veterans um, have full preference under uh, the VA supportive uh, housing uh, program. Uh, but we think that in the event that all those vouchers are utilized, uh, that Section 8 vouchers could be an alternative for veterans and that um, you might want to think about adding veterans as a preference group under uh, Section 8 housing. Okay, uh, now I'm going to quickly go over the supplementary housing uh, analyses that we were asked to uh, conduct. Mr. Karen? Yeah. Perhaps just because of this break, we could, are there any questions thus far? Um, it might be a good opportunity to just, uh, uh, Vice Mayor Durham? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, could you go back to that uh, sort of graph or the table on rental on the right. occupied? Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the thing I, I don't understand on this is you, on affordable, you say that there's a renter demand of 7,500 people, mm -hmm. but uh, there's a supply of 16,000, mm -hmm. which is over that twice that month, which seems to imply that there's a lot of affordable apartments sitting out there empty. And I, that's obviously not right. So can you explain what I'm, what I'm missing there? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the way to think of this is that um, uh, you have around 7,500 households, right, that earn between 50 and 80 percent of median family income for the Phoenix area, right? Um, but you have uh, nearly 17,000 units in this range. So what's essentially happening uh, to fill these homes is that you might have people earning zero to 30 percent of median family income, right, where there is insufficient housing. They, oh, let me keep doing this, sorry. They might be occupying these homes and stretching their budgets. That's what this suggests. Um, also, what's, what might be happening is there are folks who could afford luxury or market rate rental apartments, but um, because there are so many apartments that are available in this 50 to 80 percent range, they're choosing to live there. Okay. Uh, second question, did you conduct any sort of survey of vacancy rates um, in, in different levels of apartments? Yeah, um, we did do that. That's in um, uh, the report. Uh, I don't have the results here in the uh, slideshow, uh, but what it essentially showed is um, that a lot of homes were vacant when the census was conducted because they were uh, short-term rentals. Um, but as far as exactly what the rates were, um, I don't recall exactly, but it is in the report, and I can get back to you if you want. All right, thank you, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Councilwoman Janik. 
Quick question. All of your data is 2020? Uh, so the data that I presented here is 2020 because it's the most detailed, but they're in the report we do have some data on real estate trends that goes through 2022. Okay, because there's been quite a shift in the oh, past yeah. two years with cost. Mm -hmm. So I, sure. you know, it's nice data, but it's dated. All right. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. thank you. <laughs> sure. I just had kind of two points to make. Um, one is that there is a turnover on apartment or rentals, I'm told that it's, that the typical occupancy is two to four years. So that tells me it's every three years someone leaves and someone else takes their place. Whether it's upward mobility or getting squeezed out by the landlord or whatever is involved. So there tends to be a, just a natural, not, I don't want to say unsta uh, unst instability, but a turnover that doesn't necessarily show up as a vacancy rate, but it has to do with um, uh, people jumping from one to the other. Sometimes there's incentives from one apartment complex to say, move over here, and then we'll give you a break for two years, and after that, everything gets escalated anyway, and they hop to the next one. So just an observation that it's not that people necessarily are renting for 10 to 20 years, it's, it's much more transitory. The other thing is the distortion that we talked about in the latest, uh, uh, you know, zoom up in, in so-called appreciation. And we've also noticed a lot of cooling off in that from what I see in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So, um, but were the income, was the income stream as dramatic in terms of people's income going up by 30% when the, when the uh, appraised value is going up, you know, 30 percent. Uh, do you have that gap there, too? In other words, the income's slower than any uh, real estate appreciation. So for Scottsdale, we didn't look into that, but I conducted a similar study for Tempe, and what it showed is incomes weren't rising in proportion with housing prices. Yeah. And then just just another observation. I think you know as you compare different cities, of course Santa Fe is pretty isolated, right. whereas Pasadena is pretty much contiguous with L.A. And um, so as I weigh these things in comparison, uh, yes, there's an extreme shortage in Santa Fe, but it's very isolated from the Albuquerque area. Uh, Cherry Creek also may uh, may be more of a, a burb so to speak. So it's, it's an interesting, I'm glad you have those as well. Of course, Tempe is uh, abutting us, so we know that we're in kind of the same boat. Uh, Councilwoman Caputi and then Councilmember Milhaven. I think that point that Vice Mayor Durham just made is actually really important because when you look at this chart, I agree, it's very easy to misread it and, and see that there seems to be, you know, a surplus of housing. But I think we do have to have a conversation about vacancy rates because what, what I'm now understanding much more clearly is that it's more of a mismatch between the levels that are needed for supply and demand. And I, I don't know how we could have this conversation without talking about vacancy rates because that is exactly what's happening. We have people who could afford possibly, you know, higher rents that are dropping down and taking those housing units from the people who actually need them and same thing, jumping up. And, and I think it's the mismatch that's really important for us to dig into. So again, I hope that as we continue this conversation, we do discuss the fact that vacancy rates are incredibly low in Scottsdale and that we, we really need to talk about the matching up of supply and demand. That's it. Thanks. Done. Okay, Councilmember Millhaven and Councilwoman Littlefield. If we could go to the owner-occupied yeah. first. Thank you. So this is telling us that we have 78,480 owner-occupied units in our city. Is that right? Yes. And so, and then when you get to unit supply, what costs did you use? What value, how, what, how did you determine what the value is? Yeah, so we used uh, data from the American Community Survey, which is um, a project of the U.S. Census. Um, and they, um, 
they have a process whereby they are able to estimate uh, the value of a, a housing unit. Okay, so I bought my house 30 years ago and I right. paid one price, mm -hmm. but your study would include the current market value of It would house. include the current market value, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then what this is telling us is that based on the current market value, regardless of what somebody paid for their house, right. if they were to buy their house today, the people in the red are spending more than 30% of their income for housing at the current values. That's exactly correct. Exactly correct. So, I don't know what this tells us. I think the more important question, and maybe this gets to your next section, is what's the right mix among those income ranges of housing? Because I think what we're demonstrating here, first of all, matching today's market value versus what somebody would be paying, um, pay, may have paid in the past, is, is an important gap, right? So right. their actual costs may not be more than 30% of their income. Um, but mm -hmm. then the other is um, what we're showing, especially when we get to the rental market, is that, and what you told us is, Scottsdale residents are more affluent than the MSA and our housing costs are more than the MSA, so it says that the people who live here can, for the most part, afford to live here, which is really not addressing the issue, which is how many housing units do we need and what should the mix of price points be to have a balanced community. Um, so, yeah, because I, th I think you made the point too, the red there at the high end is saying, there's probably people who have really high incomes that are living in units that um, they could afford a much more expensive unit, they just choose to live in something a little more modest. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thank you. Welcome. Councilwoman Littlefield, Councilwoman Janik, and then Councilwoman Whitehead. Councilwoman Littlefield. Yeah, thank you. Um, and. Thank you, Linda. Uh, you made a, a number of different points here um, that I was concerned about. Um, also, uh, how many short-term rentals, how is that new ownership style, if you will, how does that affect these numbers? Do you have any kind of an approximation on that? Uh, so I have a slide. Uh deeper into the show that I can show you about short-term rentals. Um, and, yeah. and the other thing uh, that I have a little bit of a concern with too is I don't think it's the, the job of the city to do social engineering of who should live here and who should live there and who should live there. Those are free enterprise choices that people make freely. If someone wants to spend 40% or 30% of their income on a house, that's their job, that's their business, and, and they should be free to make that decision and not have the city come by and say, well, you should live in something cheaper, um, and vice versa. So I, I think there's a line here that we need to look at where freedom of the marketplace and freedom of choice kind of overrides social engineering. And so I, I would be very careful on that. And um, yeah, I'm, I am concerned about the, the short-term rentals. I think that impacts the availability of freestanding homes in Scottsdale and in all the cities, frankly. And uh, I would like to see that one too when it comes through. Thank you. Yeah. Councilwoman Whitehead and then Councilwoman Janik. I just really appreciate the study and it points to a lot of things I've been uh, a real estate investor for a long time, a lot of trends that I suspected. Um, this is 2020, prices of homes have have gone up steeply. Last time that happened, it didn't end well for, um, and it starts with the luxury often. So we do have an oversupply of luxury homes, I guess in 2020 at 14,000, that'll put downward pressure on uh, the prices there. I think it's interesting that this oversupply, we have an undersupply of luxury rentals. I would uh, recommend some of those people hanging on to houses they can't sell to consider long-term rent. Um, but also, I think, again, what we've seen is an unrealistic, uh, unrealistic, unrealistic price increases. And we know that cash buyers have uh, institutional buyers, whether short-term rentals or others, have played a role in that. Um, I've also seen recent numbers that uh, institutional 
uh, owners are also, uh, we're one of the top uh, places where institutional uh, owners are trying to unload their properties. So I think we're gonna see some corrections here. Um, and I just, I just wanna point out on the zero to 30 percent, this is um, for rentals, the lowest income. This is true in Cleveland, and it's true in San Francisco, and it's true here. This is a national problem, and I commend the mayor for stepping up to set some money aside. This is something that government is stepping up to address because we have a lowest income um, shortage in every city in America, according to articles I've read. Um, let's see. But this is very helpful, <laughs> so thank you. Councilwoman Janik. Um, I'm referring to the rental occupied market graph uh, table that you have. Um, it looks to me like, obviously we have a shortage of the zero to 30% affordable, but we have almost 2,000 in the 30 to 50% range. Based on your experience, does this cause a downward pressure where in that 30 to 50% range, the rents would go down so that they become available for the lowest income earners? I, I think that that's something that very well could happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, these, th these, these data, again, um, it does reflect one year of the COVID mm -hmm. market. Um, when you did start to see these shortages start, um, start that to uh, happen. Uh, so it's possible that over time that those landlords uh, will decide to lower their rents. On the other hand, if they're able to find someone who can't afford a market rate rental, right, and they're willing to pay that, then they might not be willing to. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If you will continue uh, with the rest of the presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so these slides um, are intended to address some of the questions that the council had asked us to consider. Uh, so one thing we were asked is, how large are the apartment and condominium inventories by zip code. Um, there should be a percentage sign next to the seven. Uh, throughout the city as a whole, 7% um, of your housing units are uh, condos, 20% are apartments, uh, and 73% of your uh, units are either single family homes or they're attached homes that have less than five uh, dwellings, so like a duplex or a triplex, et cetera. Um, now in terms of the zip codes, uh, we found that apartments and condos are virtually non-existent in the northwestern uh, part of the city uh, in zip code 85266. Um, and the next slide should make this uh, clear, it's kind of hard to see, uh, but at, at least as far as 2020 uh, goes, there were not any apartment or condo units uh, in that zip code. Um, but we also found that condos and apartments constitute at least a quarter of the housing stocks of these three other zip codes, 85251, 85257, 85260. Uh, multifamily units are most prevalent in the city's uh, second most southern uh, zip code, 85251. Um, and here's a graph that just breaks this down uh, further in more detail for you. Uh, the percentages are here on the left uh, axis, so these are uh, what this shows is the percentage of housing units that are either apartments or condos uh, by zip code. Uh, and, um, and above the uh, bars, you see the raw number of housing units. Um, and the apartments are in um, orange, the condos are in uh, gray. Uh, the zip code with the uh, largest number of apartments, 85251, 
they also, that zip code also has the largest number of condos. Okay, uh, so we were also asked um, to look at the question of whether second homeowners um, are buying or renting condos or apartments. Now the data to, exist, to assess this question uh, don't exist, uh, but I was able to uh, produce something that I think will be insightful. Uh, so the way to interpret this graph is um, if this line had an upward trend, what that would mean is that the neighborhoods where you have more uh, vacancies due to them being second homes, so the person who was a primary owner wasn't there at the time of the census, uh, uh, what, what you would see is that where you have more of these vacant second homes, you also tend to have more apartments and condos. But that's not the case. Instead, uh, in the neighborhoods of Scottsdale where you have more of these uh, second homes, you have fewer apartments in condos. So that would suggest that this isn't really a huge problem. I'm sure it happens, uh, but it's not a huge problem. Uh, Short-term rentals. Uh, so I have a lot of interesting uh, data uh, to show you, I think. Uh, so, as you know, short-term rentals represent an increasing uh, share of the Scottsdale market. Uh, and now, here is some uh, data uh, from a, a source called AirDNA that shows the number of short-term rental listings over time through uh, 2019 uh, through the uh, present. And, um, what you'll see is, uh, and I should say that the, sh that the number of short-term rentals, uh, that is denoted by the uh, blue uh, line. And these are the number of short-term rental listings on uh, VRBO and Airbnb. And what you'll see is uh, you uh, start to see a big spike uh, towards you know the uh, second of uh, the uh, fourth quarter of 2019 uh, but then COVID hits and not surprisingly you see fewer short-term rental listings right uh, but really uh, since the oh it looks like the the um, third quarter of uh, 2020 we've started to see a precipitous rise once again in the number of short-term rental listings um, and as of the second quarter of 2022 uh, what there, there were um, nearly 8,000 short-term rental listings and uh, one thing that there is definitely a, a correlation here between the number of short-term rentals uh, and the price of average long-term rent. So the, the average rental cost uh, for long-term uh, leases. Um, of course, there have been a lot of other factors at play here. This isn't all because of short-term rentals. We had the pandemic and the supply chain issues where there wasn't a whole lot of building going on. There, there's so much more at play. I don't wanna say this is all because of short-term rentals, but there is reason to think because of the fact that they diminish supply that they are one of many contributing uh, factors. Um, and one thing that I was asked to also look at was long-term rental incentives. And in my research, I came across a program that was recently instated in Breckenridge, uh, Colorado, where they are giving property owners up to $24,000 uh, for converting their short-term rentals to long-term uh, rentals. And in my research, what I found was that 
the policy took some time to start to work. But um, after six months or so, what you started to see was a decline in short-term rentals in Breckenridge as compared to other similar uh, ski resort towns in Colorado. Um, and I have a graph that demonstrates this. So this displays the number of short-term rental listings in Breckenridge, Aspen, and Vail, three cities in Colorado. Breckenridge, they instated their long-term rental incentive program, I think it was October 2021. And what you see is listings did continue to rise through uh, Q1 2022, not too surprising given that that's really where ski season is at its peak, right? But then look what you start to see in Q2 2022, there is a decline in short-term rentals. Whereas at the same time, Aspen and Vail, they did not see a drop in short-term rental listings. So this does seem to be working. Uh, now I will say this is a controversial policy for many because it's essentially government giving money to landlord or to landlords who are often pretty wealthy so it's controversial um, and it but I think these data are worth considering um, is that all that for short-term rentals I think it is uh, next I was asked to identify non congested areas of the city with adequate multifamily housing okay and these neighborhoods are denoted in orange, okay. These are census tracts, which are which are neighborhoods of typically around 4,000 or so people. Uh, and in the orange census tracts are the ones where uh, the average commute time to work is less than 20 minutes, and where apartments represent um, at least 65 percent of the housing units. And not surprisingly, these areas are in the southern uh, part of the uh, city. Um, uh, you'll, you'll see here this um, green, I mean this um, orange uh, part of the map. This is uh, most of zip code 85260. Um, you, you also see some areas um, near uh, Camelback and um, Hayden Roads that seem to be pretty non-congested uh, and have a lot of apartment availability. Uh, now, next, I, we were asked to uh, look at current supply and demand dynamics. And what we found, and we've kind of touched on this a bit, is that between January 2021 and April 2022, housing supply in Scottsdale struggled to meet demand. Okay, um, the median days on the housing market, the, the median number of days that a house was on the market during this period of time fell from 49 uh, to 21, okay? Uh, so the market was like red hot. And also the percentage of homes that sold above their list price increased from 17% to 59%. So people were engaged in these bidding wars, right, just to get a home. Now around May 2022, the market started to shift in favor of buyers as supply and demand began to converge. And by August 2022, the median home was on the market for 47 days. So pretty close to where it was in January 2021 before things really got crazy. And only 10% of homes were sold above list price compared to 59% in April. So from April 22 to August 22, the number of the percentage of homes sold above list price dropped from 59% to 10%. So that's really dramatic and it's a sign of a really like volatile market right uh, and these are some just some graphs that um, 
illustrate these points for you. Um, pretty much just reiterating what I said, uh, so I won't spend the whole uh, lot of time on them. Uh, but what but what you'll see here is this line as sort of a U shape, right? And uh, things have kind of returned to where they were in early 2021. Uh, next, we asked to look at, we uh, were asked to find out how prevalent cost burdened uh, renters and homeowners are. Um, now, as I mentioned, this is sort of a good news uh, story, okay? So, 40% uh, of renter households are cost burdened, meaning they're sending, they're spending more than 30% of their incomes on rent. Uh, that does, in an in, in, in absolute sense, that does seem kind of high, right? But when you compare yourselves to other similar communities, you're actually doing better. 31% um, uh, of owner households are cost burdened, not surprising given that owner households tend to have significantly higher incomes than renter ones, right? Uh, most of the households that are cost burdened spend at least 35% of their incomes on housing, uh, qualifying them as severely uh, cost burdened. Um, and here I just have some uh, simple pie charts that break down what I just said. So in the um, renter occupied market, 61% uh, of your households are not burdened. They're spending less than 30% uh, on, of their incomes on housing. In the owner market, this is 70%. Uh, um, and that should be it. I would welcome any more questions. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Millhaven and Councilwoman Whitehead and Janik. I um, have got quite a few questions. Or if you go back to the um, number three, short-term rentals and long-term incentives, um, I was trying to sort of dissect the segments where the, the lines were steeper. But mm -hmm. first, um, can you help understand the markings for the time frames Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's a typo in there or if I'm not reading it right. So it goes first quarter 2020, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter 2021, Q1 2021. So I'm assuming the labels are wrong and the graph is right. Follow what I'm saying? It says fourth quarter 2021 comes before first quarter. Yeah. Um, where is this? Yes, it does. Where? Where does it say that? On the label on the bottom on the, on the X. On here? Yes. Yeah, this is the fourth No, no, quarter. go to long-term, I'm, I'm looking at number three, how sh short-term rental listings average long-term. No, there's another chart, the okay, one before that. Be another one. Is it, it might be this one? Yes. Yeah, it looks like the chart might have gotten messed up. Let's see. Um, so I just wanna make sure the data points are right and just the labels are wrong before I ask my question. Yeah, so uh, the one you had a question about, it, it looks like what happened here is there was just a space where there shouldn't be, um, or there was, yeah. Like I'm assuming where it says Q4 2021, you really mean Q4 2020. Uh, Q4 2020. All right, now I see it. Okay, yes, that, sh that should be, that, that should say 2020. Okay, yes, so the data points are right, just the labels. Yeah, the, okay. the uh, data's right, the labels are wrong. All right, so if I, in looking at this then, if I look at fourth quarter 20, one to second quarter 22 where there's the steepest rise in uh, long-term rent, short-term rentals are relatively flat. Yeah. And then where we see the steepest rise in short-term rentals, long-term rent is relatively flat. So I think that sort of underscores your point that says short-term rentals certainly have an impact, right. um, but it's not the overriding influence in, in the, the prices. So I just want to make that point that yes. short-term rentals is not the solution to our problem here. Mm -hmm. um, so then in number four, you talk about non-congested areas of the city with adequate multifamily housing. Where do you, how did you, so the, the, how did you come up with who has a 20-minute commute? So the American Community Survey uh, polls a representative sample of residents asking them, um, how much time does it take you to get to work or school? Okay. Um, yeah. 
So seeing the overwhelming number of people who have a short-term commute tells me that people want to live near where they work. What it doesn't tell us is what's the average commute of people who work in Scottsdale, which really right. would, I think, start to get to what is the demand, what is the unmet demand for housing. Right. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is when we talk about shifting sales trends and days on market and things like that, we've really gotten back to a more normalized, uh, right, 50 days is a more normal market rather than the, the aberrations we've seen more recently. Um, and the other thing I'd like to point out too is, you know, when we're looking at over or under market, right, there are sellers' expectations for what they can get. There was a house that sold on my block about a year, two years ago, and when the neighbors saw the price that they got, three people put their house on the market and said, I want to cash in on this. <laughs> so some of the selling below list price may have been sellers, uh, excitement, enthusiasm, ambition to really push the price, especially if you see a market where people are paying over list, sellers are going to be a little bit more ambitious. So I think we need to be cautious when we look at that data too to say, it's as much a reflection as, as uh, seller's expectations that it is, is, as it is a function of the market. Um, so I think I just, one thing I just want to underscore too, I think that what would really, what would be really helpful here, which I know was outside of the scope of work you had is, you know, how, what's the average commute for folk or, folks who are living here if we know people who, I mean, What's the average commute for people who work in Scottsdale if we know that people, based on this, would rather live close to where they work? So, thank you. Councilwoman Whitehead, Councilwoman Janik. Uh, thank you. This is a treasure trove of uh, data, and so I'm really pleased. Thank you, staff. For this, these were some questions that I had. And I agree, you know, the, uh, there's always a lag between a factor that influences um, another trend, so the short-term rentals. I'm looking at this chart thinking maybe, and maybe that is why we're seeing a big um, surge of institutional buyers trying to sell their short-term rentals. Maybe they finally peaked and have decided to rent them. Wouldn't that be wonderful for our city? Uh, but just mostly, I want to thank you for this data. You've done a great job. You've really hit on the... Uh, points that I was looking for and gives me an opportunity to dig in deeper where I need to. So thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Janik, Councilwoman Caputi. Okay, I have a question on, um, it says number one, how large are the apartment and condominium inventories by zip code? Mm -hmm. Which I think you have, you know, another data chart on that with the same data. Yeah. Does this include short-term rentals? This, um, this does not, no. And you were able to eliminate short-term rentals in your data collection. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's tricky because we have a lot that aren't yeah, registered as short-term rentals. My understanding is that uh, people who are residing in short-term rentals, uh, that they wouldn't be considered residents and they probably wouldn't be polled by the American Community Survey. I could look more into that. I would like that because I'd like to know how you identify them yeah. so that we can send letters to them and tell them they need to get registered. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, it, it, definitely, I question the data because, because of that. Yeah. Um, and then my other question has to do with Breckenridge giving uh, property owners $24,000. Do you know, and maybe you don't know, but if you know, how long is this money going to be available for? Is it a pot of money? And once it's used up, we're done. Are they going to renew it every year? Is it for five years? Do you have any more information on that? So all that I know is that um, it was definitely in place last winter in okay. preparation for the migrant workers who come up to work in the ski resorts. I haven't been able to find out any information about whether this is something that's they're going to be using long term or, yeah. Okay, and again, thank you very much. This yeah. is really good information um, that we can use, we can all use to make decisions on where the city needs to go with construction projects and rental units, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councilwoman Caputi. Just a couple of comments, not so many questions. So I took a couple of notes. One thing you threw out there, um, sort of 70% 
single family homes versus 30% apartment condo. I think that's a really interesting number. We get asked that all the time. What's the percentage? How many apartments do we have? And I've asked city staff this question before, and I've been told that that hasn't really moved much in decades, that that's generally been our percentage, 70-30-ish, sometimes skewing towards 60-40, but basically staying in that range. And I just think that's a really interesting data point um, to underscore, because again, we get asked that all the time. Um, the biggest takeaway for me after reading hundreds of pages of your report was that for the people who already live here, we can afford our houses. Our real problem is that we are not able to attract you know, the folks who ne might not necessarily be able to live here. Young families, people, you know, uh, workforce housing, that, that's the thing that we're trying to concentrate on here in our, in our council. And I think um, what you've told us basically just reminds us of what we already know, that we can afford this city, but you know, what are we doing about attracting young families, uh, people with children, folks who might not necessarily be as comfortable. Um, the other point I wanted to make um, just kind of underscores what Councilwoman Milhaven said. You show the before and after and it makes it seem like, oh, the, the problem's been solved, we, we're affordable now. But I agree, it's simply that the market has normalized. I mean, having 10% of houses still selling above an asking price is a pretty hot market. And it's not that prices have necessarily uh, moderated. The real underlying problem here is that mortgage rates have gone up exponentially, of course, and so people can't afford to make those offers anymore because when they do the consideration of price and you know mortgage rate every month, it's exponentially higher, and of course that's gonna change the amount of the house that they're able to afford. But it hasn't really solved the problem that we, we still have an issue with people not being able to afford certain housing. And then if, the last thing I just wanna um, say is that I agree, this is amazing data, and we could twist it and turn it in pretty much any way we need or want, like all data, and I would just say the question for us is, you know, what are we gonna do with it? <laughs> So let's see what happens. It's, it's really good stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I would just add one other thing. It's true that uh, doubling of interest, uh, interest rates is the prime external uh, uh, power that's, that's propelling and will make growth more static because people will not be selling if they own it outright or have a three percent mortgage. I went to the ULI conference last, summer, uh, last spring and they, they, they predicted that, that people basically would not, uh, excuse me, 70 percent of the new mortgages were under three and a half percent. So we knew that they were going to tip to four, four and a half. So upon selling and then realizing now, of course, they're seven percent. So that, that is a s substantial suppression on uh, mobility, and that also affects the demand. I would say that um, the the mix should not exceed. Uh, architects have their own measure as well. Uh, typically, about 25 percent of a so-called suburb or a uh, you know to our scale would be multifamily. Uh, it it if it were to hit 50 percent. That would be really an overbalance, uh, changing the identity of, of our uh, suburban city, uh, so to speak. Okay, um, I think everyone has spoken. Councilmember Milhaven, you have something else? Yeah, Virat, real quickly. I think you make an important point about mix, right? We need to look at the percentages. A lot of the charts that you've shown us show absolute numbers, which depending on the size of a community or a neighborhood or a zip code may be a little bit misleading. So if we look at percents, of housing in those units that might be more telling. Um, the other thing, I, the other point I wanted to make was when I looked at the 2020 census data, we have few, fewer rental units than uh, the Phoenix MSA or Arizona or the U.S. So I don't know what the right number is, but I do know we have fewer rental units uh, than most communities. Um, so we want to make that point. And then um, the other thing I want to point out, if you go back to the owner-occupied market, I was playing with the calculator on my phone. The red adds up to 19,000 households. 
and if we're at 78,000 households, what that's telling us is 25% of the people who own homes in Scottsdale could not afford to buy their homes today, which asks right. the question of who's, who, what will we look like as those folks move on and sell their home. And, you know, if they're young families and things in some of those more modest income brackets, you know, will we have young families be able to afford us? And so that's really concerning to me if we say 25% of the people who make up our community couldn't afford to buy it today. Lastly, I just want to say 30%, having been a mortgage lender in the past, Right, if you want to get a mortgage, they have ratios for how much you want to spend. And so I don't know what the ratios are today, but they've always been sort of in the mid to high 20s to say your mortgage, your uh, taxes, and your insurance shouldn't exceed. So that 30% is a really good indicator for affordability, particularly as it relates to people's ability to qualify for financing. So thank you for the opportunity to make a few more comments. So thank you. That would close uh, your part of the presentation. We will move on to the next work study item, which is housing. And Human Services five-year consolidated plan. Um, once again, Mary Witkowski, Witkowski, Interim Community Assistance Manager. Good evening again. I will try to make it short so we can all go home. Um, so my first slide is why do we have a consolidated plan here in the city of Scottsdale? So currently, Scottsdale is an entitlement city. Um, we are recipients of HUD funding, and we are required to develop a plan every five years to assess uh, the needs of our community and prioritize services to, pro to meet those needs. The current consolidated action plan that we have was adopted by the mayor and city council in May of 2020, and currently is valid through 2024. So up here, you see the three Ps of CDBG, or the goals of the community development program. But what does that really mean? So the first one is to provide decent housing. It means helping homeless persons obtain appropriate housing and assisting those at risk of homelessness, preserving the affordable housing stock, increasing the availability of permanent housing that is affordable to low and moderate income persons without discrimination, and increasing the supply of supportive housing. Providing a suitable environment entails improving the safety and livability of our neighborhoods, increasing access to quality facilities and services, and reducing the isolation of income groups within an area through integration of low-income housing opportunities. And lastly, expanding our economic opportunities involves creating jobs that are accessible to low moderate income persons, promoting long-term economic and social viability, and empowering low and income persons to achieve self-sufficiency. So through the consolidated action plan process, which included a community survey, as well as public input, seven priority needs were identified. These priority needs are listed. Once the priority needs were identified, we then established five goals and objectives. Affordable housing, please note that this one only current relates, relates to our housing rehabilitation programs, currently at the Community Assistance Office, which is our green rehab, our emergency repair program, and our emergency roof and replacement. Public facilities and infrastructure, Public services, these can be administered either by city staff or provided to nonprofit organizations through a competitive process, but only comprise about 15% of the total allocation that the city receives. We also receive home funding. We are part of the Maricopa County Home Consortium and on average receive about 345,000 in funds through a competitive process. We've been utilizing this to acquire and rehabilitate affordable homes here in Scottsdale. And lastly, support our program administration, which only comprises about 20% of our funds that come from HUD. Um, it pays for your personnel, public notifications, um, community outreach, and any additional studies, such as the housing study that just took place tonight. So what are some of the outcomes that we have achieved? So a picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> So I put up some pictures of our current housing rehab programs. On the left, you'll see emergency repair. And on the right, you'll see a before and after of our green housing rehabilitation program. Through the last three years, we've assisted a total of 65 homes through green housing rehabilitation, our roof repair, and our replacement and emergency repairs. These numbers of individuals served 
um, has historically been much higher. On average, we are serving about 65 per year, but once the pandemic hit, we dropped to 65 in the last three years. Um, the reduction is basically due to the fact that um, it impacted our ability of staff to go into the homes during the COVID pandemic. Um, there was an increase or a decrease um, in labor supply and an increase in the cost of materials also playing a role into the amount of homes that we could actually repair. So we do have funding programs. Public services include funding from our community development block grant, our Scottsdale Cares, general funds, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, and our endowment funds. Over the last three years, we have distributed approximately $1.7 million um, to nonprofits here in the city of Scottsdale, serving a combined total of 12,316 unduplicated residents. Looking at our public infrastructure or public facilities, currently we have three projects um, that we're working on. We are replacing um, Apache Park playground equipment. We are demolishing and reconstructing the bathrooms at the Paiute Neighborhood Center. Um, park, and then we are also actually currently working with Public Works and repaving roads in the Cox Heights neighborhood. So what about our landlord engagement? I know last year um, we spoke a little bit to you about as we kicked off our landlord engagement program, um, it, has, it has and will continue to increase our housing options for Scottsdale Housing Choice Voucher participants. Over the last 11 months since launching the program, the Scottsdale Housing Agency has added a total of 31 additional affordable units, and of those were 17 new landlords we brought to the city of Scottsdale. Wanting to work with the city, and 14 landlords that we currently worked with added additional 14 units. The homes added have allowed the voucher holders to lease up in a broader set of mixed income neighborhoods with 16% of those landlords incentivized were in upper income census tracts, 55% leasing in the middle income census tracts, and 29% in the moderate income census tracts. Through these 31, 22 landlords received a signing bonus, and the Community Assistance Office supported the voucher holders through assistance. Um, about 26 of them received emergency security deposit assistance. That is a revolving fund, so once the resident, if the resident moves out, that fund get, then gets returned back to the city as long as there aren't damages and goes to help the next person. 26% of those incentivized units were actually given to households that were homeless or at severe risk of homelessness. With our current monthly lease up rate, the community assistance office is on track to add 100 additional homes or rental units by the end of this fiscal year for housing choice voucher participants. And this initiative is responding to the affordable housing crisis and meeting four housing goals in the Scottsdale's general plan of 2035 to include support, diverse, safe resources, efficient and high quality housing options, provide a variety of housing options that meet the socioeconomic needs of people who live and work here in Scottsdale, providing housing options that allow for all generations of Scottsdale residents to live here regardless of their life stage or ability, and abide by regulations that prevent housing discriminations towards any person. And here is a graph to just kind of show um, our landlord incentives and our engagement program how we're doing. So what about our affordable housing? So in the Community Assistance Office, we do also have the Scottsdale Housing Agency. You will see that we have a 66% utilization rate of our housing choice vouchers. The housing, choice voucher, or the housing agency not only has housing choice vouchers, but we also have specialty vouchers that include emergency housing vouchers, our foster youth independence, and then the VASH vouchers are for Veterans Affairs. In October of 2022, the, city, the Scottsdale Housing Agency did apply to receive stability housing vouchers to assist individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness. We have approximately seven, 735 housing vouchers that we can distribute. Unfortunately, only 468 of them are currently being utilized, thus the 66% utilization rate. The low utilization rate has contributed to a number of factors that include the high cost in the rental market, the fair market rents rates that we are required to use that are approved by HUD, 
They do not reflect the inflation, and the Scottsdale Housing Agency is spending 98% of its allocated budget for the 468 families. So even if we wanted to exceed our 66% rate, we have to make sure that HUD allocates us more money. The Community Assistance Office, like I said, has applied to receive additional vouchers to help those families who are experiencing homelessness. So how do we help those families then become self-sufficient? So our Community Assistance Office does have our Family Self-Sufficiency Program designed to help public, um, public housing residents and our Housing Choice Voucher participants of, of multifamily assisted housing to increase their earnings and build assets and financial capability. The program lasts for a period of five years. To date, the program has enrolled 68 individuals and we have dispersed over $32,000 in escrow payments. The participants that are currently enrolled, there are 10 and we have a total of 45,000 right now in escrow. Some significant achievements in the last three years to point out, one individual is in the process of purchasing a home one has purchased a new car and was able to attain a new and higher permanent payment in employment, and others have maintained consistent employment and are receiving raises. So they are becoming self-sufficient. So now we have our home funding. We currently partner with um, Affordable Rental Movement of Save the Family, and in the last two years, we have added two units that have been rehabilitated and used for low-income rentals. The affordability period for these housing units is currently 15 years. Scottsdale also owns the Bellevue One properties. We have eight affordable housing units. The property is currently professionally managed through a contract with Dunlap McGee, and our annual revenue from this Bellevue property is about 77,000 a year. So what can you expect going forward from us at the Community Assistance Office? We receive a variety of funding from very varying federal sources, and while the Consolidated Action Plan is comprehensive, the objectives need to be broadly based to accommodate the growth of housing affordability in this community. In the coming months, you will see a substantial amendment coming before Council um, addressing some of the following activities. One of them includes using our home funds for program year 22-23 or 23-24 um, to start a tenant-based rental assistance for seniors. Um, for those who are currently being displaced. So we're actually going to look to retain the funding here and operate it directly out of the Community Assistance Office. The City of Scottsdale also has received approximately $1.4 million through the Home um, ARP funds, and we can only utilize these funds to assist those with tenant-based rental assistance, rental housing acquisition, meaning purchasing rental housing, purchasing um, a facility for non-congregate shelter and, and or looking at supportive services. The home art funds is meant to help those who are at homeless, at risk of becoming homeless, or those fleeing a domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, sexual assault, or human traffic incident, and or veterans and veterans family members who are experiencing one of those listed above. But it is directly um, related to the purchase and expanding affordable housing options here in Scottsdale. That concludes my presentation, if you have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Witkowski. Um, I'll, um, I'll lead off just to two items, and then we have Councilwoman Whitehead and Councilwoman Janik. Um, one has to do with the, uh, you know, the voucher uh, amount, and that's usually a trailing number that trails, you know, what, what the market is. But I understood we had a fairly large uh, jump in voucher assistance. Maybe it was mid-year, but could you just kind of give us a little overview of that? You want to talk a little bit more about the landlord engagement because that's well, um, I was actually just where the voucher about, yeah, increased. Yeah, is it is it applicable? I think it was under a thousand, and now it jumped to a higher number for a voucher. But maybe it's rolled into the uh, uh, the landlord engagement. So our landlord incentive program, and, and if I don't answer your question, please let me know, sir, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, we do provide landlords currently a $1,000 signing bonus or incentive to sign into the program. Um, we also have a damage claim program that we currently are not using because we just are starting to lease those individuals up. Um, those funds come from our general funds, and then our community development block grant pays for the emergency um, security deposit. So those 30 additional units were from landlord security or landlord signing bonuses. 
Good. And then another item that's come up from time to time is Project Fix It. And I know we have rehab programs that are multifaceted, but can you just explain how and where uh, Project Fix It or the equivalent is? Sure, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Operation Fix It is um, currently um, now housed under the Human Services Department. Um, in the past, historically, um, our housing rehabil rehabilitation specialists did work with Michelle Holmes directly, and we do expect that um, partnership to continue with Mike Lopatch, who has taken over that um, program. Any types of programs that we can't offer, we do have an income eligibility with regards to our housing rehabilitation program. So if somebody is over income, we're not able to assist them um, through the HUD regulations. So at that point, we do work with Operation Fix It. There are also limitations. Um, we can't do landscaping. We can't do painting unless it's part of a larger project. Um, so it really is a partnership that's married together between the two. Good. And then I just want to add a comment about your green building or better insulation. Really, uh, kind of the worst um, tax is uh, uh, bad energy efficiency. So here you have a renter with a home, renting a home with very poor insulation or, and so forth. And that's just, a, it, it's an avoidable expense. I'm glad we look at that with over 60 homes uh, helped. Councilwoman Whitehead, Councilwoman Janik. Thank you. So it's nice to end where we're tackling the one area that we have the biggest need. And I think every city has this biggest need. Um, so I want to, I also, Operation Fix It was on my question list. It tr transitioned, I'm getting calls that it's not available. Could you, I, I didn't understand your answer. Just one more time. Um, Operation Fix It has been transferred over to the Human Services Department and is currently being managed by Michael Lopech, okay, Human so Services is, Manager. But somebody looking to, I have people that are looking that contacted and they said it's shut down. Is there, it's the same link on the city website. Is there a difference on how someone would reach out to the, to get the... Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'll have to check on the website and okay. follow up with you. I don't know, yeah, I don't have I that answer. Some of us have been contacted. That That is a crucial program, I will say. Can you explain the 1.4 million, I, um, that the home fund, how, and it's for the acquisition or construction. Could, sure. you, could you expand on that? Sure, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So last year, um, the city of Scottsdale was awarded and we are still working through the contract, uh, $1,442,098 to be exact, um, from the Maricopa County through the home consortium. Approximately 116,000 of that is set aside for program administration um, for staff to administer the project. The remaining amount of funds must go toward either tenant-based rental assistance or through the acquisition of property, such as a non-congregate shelter and or rental housing for the purchase to expand affordable housing options within a community. That's huge and exciting. Thank you. And I just want to say, you know, you look at these numbers of, of our needs and then you look at the numbers of success stories, but each one of these, these are people. And I, you know, when I had a a constituent called me about um, seniors getting forced out of their houses. You guys were there that morning, and you guys provided bridge um, housing for those people. I just really want to thank all of you. Agreed. And Councilwoman Janik. Um, first of all, could you repeat the name of the person in human services that's responsible for the fix-it program? Because I've had complaints as well. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Michael Lopach. Can you spell L-O-P-A-C-H? Yes. His supervisor is Greg Bestian, the human services director in the back. Okay. <laughs> um, and then I had another question with the voucher program. About a year ago, we couldn't, we were having troubles getting landlords to accept the voucher program. Things are changing. Is there improvement in the program now? It sounds like you added, I think, 14, you said. So we're beginning to see improvement in that plan. Mr. It Mayor, members of the council, yes. Um, through the landlord incentives and the signing bonus of $1,000, that's really what's driving it forward. Okay, and then uh, two more questions. Uh, the program administration is 20%. Is that the industry average? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that is the HUD regulation. It can't exceed that amount. Okay. And my last question is, I know, I believe you said with Scottsdale Cares, 
um, you're going to be adding or place more emphasis on seniors? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm actually using the home funding, which you saw we partnered with ARM, Affordable Rental Movement, through Save the Family. We get an average of $345,000 a year. Um, we have an additional program year of 22 mon monies coming, so starting July of next year, we're looking to um, implement tenant-based rental assistance for seniors specifically. Okay, and what about veterans? Do we have any programs for them yet, or...? Currently, we do have our VASH vouchers, our Veterans Assistance Supportive Housing vouchers, and we do partner with uh, Veterans Affairs. Unfortunately, we have to rely on the VA to make those referrals to our office in order for us to utilize those veteran vouchers. We have made numerous calls. We do have ongoing meetings with the VA. Um, we have reached out to um, some local shelters that are around the Phoenix area to say, do you have any veterans that are Scottsdale residents? Do they need a place? to stay, but uh, we have to wait for the VA to actually make the referral in order for us to utilize our 15 veteran vouchers that we have. So it sounds like we have excess on the veterans vouchers because of red tape. Is that a pretty good? That is a fair statement. statement. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for all you're doing. Uh, Councilwoman Caputi. Just a really quick question that uh, Councilwoman Janik just reminded me of. I know that there's a problem with um, sort of incenting a landlord to go ahead and accept a Section 8 um, tenant. So I've heard about other cities um, passing ordinances that restrict the landlord's ability to ask about source of income because there's that stigma. You know, once they see that the rent's going to come from a Section 8 housing, they don't want to rent. Is that something that you think would be helpful or that the city has actually thought about? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I do know that Tucson um, is probably the only city in the state that has done a sole source discrimination ordinance. Do you th what do you think? Is it something we would consider or do you think it would be helpful? Is it, is it a problem here in Scottsdale? Do you, do you find that, that, renters, that landlords are reluctant? Or do you think that the cash incentives sort of fixes most of that? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that's a complicated question um, <laughs> to answer. Um, Yes to both. Okay. <laughs> the incentives gen generally do help, um, but I can't. There are certain properties um, that are not willing to rent to Section 8 housing yeah. doing to, due to myths and stigmas, so it's about education and information. Okay, thank you. I, just, I think it's an interesting idea. Again, we don't want to interfere too much with free market and all of that, but I, it, it is interesting. Um, uh, that, that approach from Tucson just ca captured my attention. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Wyskowski. Um, I would just add, when our uh, League of Cities discussion of this topic, there was an interesting uh, formula whereby you had market and then below rate in the same complex. And I found that as an interesting solution. It makes the numbers. It's not that one is 100% you know, market rate and luxury or whatever, but there was some other medium uh, with, with the mixed type. Okay, with that, thank you. We're concluded with our work study. And at this point, I would be open to a motion to adjourn. A motion, and uh, I second that. And please record your vote. Thank you, Ms. Whitehead. We are adjourned.